Welcome to Fridays with a Forester. This is April 19th, 2024. Minnesota ticks and mosquitoes. What you should know is our topic today. And uh, just to reinforce uh, our host today, myself is Gary Wyatt, Extension Educator with our forestry team out of Mankato Regional Office, and Lauren Beckus, uh, Regional Support Staff at Andover. So Lauren's going to help with the questions uh, to Alex today. Our speaker and topic today is Minnesota ticks and mosquitoes, what you should know. Our uh, speaker today is Alex Garvin. She's with the University, or excuse me, with the Minnesota Department of Health. And we thank her for joining us today. This is a Zoom webinar, so we don't see any other, each other's faces uh, except for the panelists. So we ask you to put your questions in the Q&A. And then all of our recordings are recorded at our Z-Link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. We'll try and end at 10 o'clock, but if we have questions that go past that, we'll go past 10 o'clock with questions. So, Alex, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'll let you start. Perfect. Hello, everyone. And I might turn off my camera just to maintain some Wi-Fi as I present, that I can turn it back on for questions. Okay. So, hopefully everyone can see that as... Looks Full good. Full screen. Looks good. Okay. Perfect. Let me just get this pulled up. Okay. So please ask any questions in the chat. I will have my contact info at the end too. If you have a more personal question you want to email or call me about, um, feel free. And um, yeah, this is very timely. We've had some very unseasonably warm days. I know my mom has been sending me pictures of ticks she has found on herself. Um, and I recently got bit by a mosquito. So um, <laughs> they are out and about. Okay, so vector-borne diseases in Minnesota. To set the scene, um, vector-borne diseases vary a lot by geography. So risk is not consistent throughout the state or even throughout a county or region. Um, vector-borne diseases are very complex in terms of disease control and prevention. And the situation is always changing. Um, like anything in infectious disease, we are seeing new diseases come up. We are seeing um, increases in cases, cases in new areas on the human side and from um, human surveillance. Here is a nice timeline of vector-borne diseases in Minnesota. So we have our um, blue boxes that are showing mosquito-borne diseases and then tick-borne diseases are in green. For those that do not know, back in the day, we did have endemic malaria in Minnesota. Luckily, that is no longer an issue um, and we do not have any local malaria. And then we have some of our um, slightly older diseases. Lyme disease has been around for a bit, followed by Babesia and Anaplasma, which are two other common tick borne diseases. Um, and then West Nile was a little bit after that. And then we have some relatively new disease agents as well. Um, Jamestown Canyon virus was identified in 2013 and is an endemic mosquito-borne disease. And then we have a few Borrelia species. So Borrelia neonii is relatively new and um, that is a species that can cause Lyme disease. This is very general, but typically we see our tick-borne diseases. Um, the first onset date is in a little bit earlier than our mosquito-borne diseases. So we see spring into early summer, and then that is followed by our mosquito-borne diseases as we get later into the summer. Um, and then we also have our ticks come back out a little bit later in the fall. So getting into tick biology and ecology. We have three ticks of public health concern in Minnesota. On the left, we have a map of where that tick is distributed. And then we have in the middle, the adult female of that tick species, and then what pathogens or disease agents can be transmitted by that tick. So at the top is the black like a tick, also commonly referred to as the deer tick. And the deer tick is what is responsible for all of our endemic tick-borne diseases in Minnesota. Lyme is by far our most common and the one that is most um, talked about and you probably see it in the news the most followed by anaplasmosis and babesiosis, which are um, number two and number three for our most common tick-borne diseases. There is a newer form of Ehrlichia, Ehrlichia oclaris, um, oclaris census, that is in Minnesota as well, Wasson virus and tick-borne relapsing fever. And then we have our American dog tick, which is really throughout the whole state, but it's more of just a nuisance. Um, you probably will see them everywhere, especially in the middle of the summer, but they very rarely transmit diseases. 
they could transmit um, and be responsible for something in the Rocky Mountain spotted fever group or tularemia, but we very rarely see cases. And then there is the Lone Star Tick that is not yet established in Minnesota. Right now, it's kind of creeping up our southern border. Um, so we'll sporadically get reports, but it um, hasn't been established. And to establish a tick for our purposes and the CDC criteria, we either within one season need to find two life stages of the tick or six of one life stage, so like six adult ticks or a larval tick and a nymphal tick. Um, so it's not yet established anywhere in Minnesota, which is good, but it has been associated with a few different species of Ehrlichia. So Ehrlichia chaffiensis is the bigger one. Alpha gal, um, which is more of a condition, but this is um, in the news a lot recently. This is what is referred to as the tick bite red meat allergy has been associated with the Lone Star tick and then tularemia. And so as I go through this presentation, I will be focused on the black legged tick as all of our endemic diseases are transmitted by it. So black legged tick life stages, and to situate yourself, this is a dime on the side. So black legged ticks are much smaller than the American dog tick or the Lone Star tick. The larval tick, you would have to really be looking for it to see it, but it looks like a speck of dirt or a freckle. Luckily, it cannot yet transmit any disease agents, so you don't have to worry about it biting you. We have the nymphal tick, which could potentially um, transmit disease, and then the adult tick. So the nymphal tick is about the size of a poppy seed, so super teeny tiny. Um, it's really easy to miss when we have interviewed people that have tick-borne diseases. It is not uncommon that people don't remember getting bitten by a tick or ever seeing one, um, but they are so small, especially if it gets on you know the back of your neck or behind your knee, it is really easy to miss. And then our adult female black-legged tick that has that like reddish brown um, area on her back compared to the male tick that's more of that darker color throughout its whole back. So not all ticks are infected, which some people believe they are. Um, a lot of them are though, so it is still very important to be good about tick-borne disease prevention. 37% of black-legged ticks are infected with a disease agent, um, and 30% of the ticks are infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the bacteria that causes Lyme. So most of that 37% is ticks um, that are infected with the Lyme bacteria, but also other things like Babesia, Anaplasma, um, some other Borrelia species as well. So here is a great graphic showing the black-legged tick life cycle. So we start with our engorged female in the spring and normally ticks live between two and three years depending. And so in the spring, we have a mama tick very pregnant with all of her eggs and she will lay them in the early spring and then they will hatch into larva. Um, and when the larva are um, first hatched, they're not infected with anything yet. They have to pick that up from a reservoir host. Um, and between each life stage, a tick will have one blood meal. So between larva, nymphal, adult tick, it will only feed once. So we have the larval tick. It is so small that it really can't attach onto a human. So it will go for things like small mammals, like the white-footed mouse, or maybe it will find a bird. And during that first blood meal is when the larva is able to pick up a pathogen. So for um, Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, the prime reservoir host is the white-footed mouse as it's really good at harboring that bacteria. So the larva could feed on that, pick it up, and by the next time it bites someone when it's a nymph, it could then pass on that pathogen. So the larva has its blood meal, then it will hang out, and then in the next spring, it will be ready to molt into a nymph. And then the nymphs are a little bit bigger, a little bit more confident, so they're okay um, feeding on something a bit larger like a human or a deer and it could have been infected now with a disease agent. So now it is at risk for spreading diseases to human or other animals. Um, and so the nymphs will feed spring, summer, and then they will hatch into an adult or molt into an adult in the fall. And then the adult will try to feed one more time. Um, hopefully the female will be able to feed and then find a mate and lay some eggs the following spring. If not, she might have to overwinter and try to feed again in the spring and find a mate that way. So tick activity in Minnesota, which this is a hot topic as it has been so warm out recently. At the top, we have the nymphal black-legged tick. In the middle is our two adult black-legged ticks. And then at the bottom, we have the adult dog tick, or commonly referred to as the wood tick. So the nymphal ticks we see a little bit later. So spring going into summer is when they are most active. Our adult ticks have a longer 
um, time where they are active. So we normally start to see them in the spring and then they'll have a recurrence in the fall after those nymphal ticks that were out and about earlier in the spring, early summer um, will molt and then come out as adults in the fall. And then our wood ticks have a bit of a shorter period of peak activity. And as you can see for the adult black-legged ticks, we do have that yellow potential for activity all throughout the year. And that is because if the temperature is over about 40 degrees or there isn't much snow cover on the ground, even if it's just a little patch of melted snow, those ticks could be out and could be active, even if it's maybe not a high density of ticks, um, it's possible they're out and about. So that's why we always recommend if it's, you know, above 40 and there's patches of your yard that are melted, still be conscious that there could be ticks out using preventative measures, which we will get into in a second, and then doing tick checks is really important to reduce your disease risk. So for people that are outside a lot, this um, image is probably very familiar. This is ideal black-legged tick habitat. So one of the biggest fears for a tick is drying out. So they really love having good canopy cover, leaf litter, vegetation to help retain that moisture and provide some shade. Um, the American dog tick, also known as the wood tick, is a little bit less picky. So they'll be in more of like prairie opened areas, but the black-legged tick really wants their forested areas. And um, the, you know, low growing vegetation leaf litter also attracts little critters that can be great hosts for the ticks. Um, and the leaf litter is where they will often kind of bury themselves during the day when it gets really hot um, or it's too dry and the ticks can help retain some of that moisture that way. Um, and so a few myths about ticks. Um, one, ticks, black leaf ticks do not have eyeballs. Um, ticks can also not jump. They cannot fly. They're not going to fall on you from a tree. How ticks find their host is a behavior called questing. So basically they'll crawl a little bit up, probably not higher than the average person's chin, stick up their arms, and then wait for a signal that there is some living being um, going past them since they don't have eyes to see. So they'll sense things like CO2, body heat, movement. And when they sense something, they will latch on um, and then crawl around on you or the animal until they can find a nice spot to attach where they feel safe um, and then hopefully get a nice blood meal out of it. Here are some of our Minnesota biomes and then tick-borne disease risk. So on the left, we have a map of Minnesota's unique land biomes, which some of you may be familiar with. And then on the right is a map of tick-borne disease risk. And the risk map is based on the average incidence of our top three tick-borne diseases. So Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis, um, cases per 100,000 by their county of residence. And we have our darkest color is our higher tick-borne disease risk. And then the lightest shade is lower. And um, surprise, surprise, areas that are forested is where we have higher tick-borne disease risk. So it does um, align very nicely with our bio map. And we see in that southwest corner, that's mostly prairies and grasslands. We would not expect a lot of tick-borne disease because that is not a spot um, where there'd be high tick densities. So getting into our actual diseases. Here is a list of diseases that are transmitted by black-legged tick. So Lyme disease, as I said, by far our most common. Um, if you talk to anyone, they probably know someone who has had Lyme disease. It is a bacterial infection. And then it is followed by anaplasmosis, which is also a bacterial infection. Um, babesiosis, we see a lot less cases of. It is a parasitic infection, so it needs to be treated um, in addition to antibiotics like you would for Lyme or anaplasmosis with an antiparasitic. Powassan virus, I will have a slide on a little bit later, but it is a very interesting emerging infection that is actually a virus. And then we have Ehrlichia mirus oclarensis, which is a newer species of Ehrlichia we are seeing in black-legged ticks. So for symptoms and diagnoses, um, most of our tick-borne diseases have very similar symptoms, which can make it kind of tricky um, to diagnose. So symptoms will usually show up within a few weeks to a month of being bitten by an infected tick. And some symptoms can be pretty nondescript. So um, people often think of Lyme will have that classic bullseye rash or erythema migrans, which might be present, but is not always present for Lyme cases. And um, if it's not a beautiful, you know, big, clear bullseye, it might be faint or look a little different than one would expect or on a part of a body that's hard to see. So don't rely on just seeing that rash is when you should go in and get tested for a tick-borne disease. 
Other symptoms are fever, headache. Um, people will just feel it really run down, aches and pains in their joints or muscles, um, weakness, things like that. Just feeling, feeling pretty yucky. So if you ever start to feel sick and you are someone that either has a known tick bite or you live in an area where you know you could have been exposed to ticks, please go in and see your healthcare provider. Um, and generally they will ask if you have any known um, tick exposure, if you have pretty classic symptoms, but even if you aren't asked, still volunteer that information because that can help guide um, what testing they order. And then a healthcare provider will diagnose a tick-borne disease based on your exposure history. You know, do you have a tick bite? Have you been in an area where you could have been exposed to ticks? They'll do a physical exam. Um, some of our tick-borne diseases, you might have slightly funky blood work that can help um, tune into what specific disease might be impacting you. And then there are various different laboratory testing that can be done for each disease to help determine infection. Getting into our tick-borne disease numbers. So I will have um, a different graph the next slide, but this is good for more of our visual people looking at tick-borne disease progression over time. So starting in 1996, going through 2021, five-year increments of tick-borne disease incidence. So similar to our risk map, this is looking at the average incidence for that five-year period of cases of Lyme, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis per 100,000 people by the county of residence. As you can see, as time goes on, we see a lot more blue. So that is saying we're seeing more counties that are having tick-borne diseases. And as time progresses, they're having a lot higher rates of tick-borne disease, which is what we expect the trend to be. And then here is also a nice bar chart of our top three tick-borne diseases from 1996 to 2022. We have Lyme disease on the bottom in that navy color. Anaplasmosis is the lime green. And then babesiosis is the lighter blue. Um, and in 1996, there were a few cases of babesiosis, but I think it was just three. So it's very hard to see. Um, there were some cases just gets um, overpowered by our Lyme disease. And as time has progressed, we are seeing more cases. You may notice 2020 um, does not have any case data because here at the health department, um, we were a little overrun by pandemic response. So could not follow up on our cases, um, but we are seeing a general trend of increase and there could be a few different factors impacting this as well. So maybe providers are um, you know, more aware of what they should be testing for. People are better advocating for themselves. We could be seeing ticks in new areas or you know, having higher density of ticks that are um, harboring pathogens, a um, few different factors that could be playing into this increase in numbers. And then I always like to touch on Powassan virus because I think it's just a fascinating disease. Um, it is an emerging tick-borne disease. It is a flavivirus, which is incredibly similar to West Nile, which is also a flavivirus. So when we test for Powassan, it's normally with our endemic mosquito-borne diseases. Um, we had our first case in 2008, and in 2023, I think we'll end up with about um, eight cases. So it's really rare, but when we do see cases, it's people that are critically ill um, and generally have a much higher fatality rate. And since um, it is an arbovirus, all of our arboviruses in Minnesota have no known treatment. So severe cases have to be treated supportively. And we typically see cases up in the north central part of the state, similar to our other tick-borne diseases. And then I always like to chat a little bit about mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases, as we do still have mosquito-borne diseases in Minnesota, even though a bit less common in case numbers than our tick-borne diseases. So we have over 50 species of mosquitoes in Minnesota. Most of them will not bite you, which is surprising because it does often feel like we are just getting absolutely swarmed, but most species do not want to feed on humans. And luckily, only a few of them actually are able to transmit disease. We have three endemic mosquito-borne diseases in Minnesota. West Nile virus is by far our most common. Um, fun fact, if you donate blood, you will be screened for West Nile virus because it can be occasionally um, acquired through blood transfusions. Then we have lacrosse encephalitis and Jamestown Canyon virus. Most mosquito-borne diseases, people will be asymptomatic if they're infected and or will have very mild symptoms, just like maybe a light headache or a little bit of a fever. For people who do become sick, it's a bit of a quicker time than our tick-borne diseases. Normally within two weeks, you will have become symptomatic if you are to develop symptoms. 
Um, and they can be things like fever, headache. Some people will get a, you know, a rash, feeling fatigued, weak. Um, but some people will then progress to severe neuroinvasive disease, which will present as viral meningitis, encephalitis, acute flaccid paralysis, seizures. Um, and those are more of the cases that we see because if you are asymptomatic, you are not getting tested. Um, so when cases come to the health department, normally it is people who fall into the more severe disease camp. And there is unfortunately no vaccine or any treatment for these cases. And we likely um, have a lot of underreporting just because people that have very mild symptoms like a headache, um, their provider probably is not going to order a full mosquito-borne disease panel. And then like our tick-borne diseases, geography is very important for mosquito-borne diseases. So we have that map of Minnesota's unique land biomes again, and then our three different endemic mosquito-borne diseases and showing areas where we perceive more risk. So on the left is West Nile virus, and that is a risk map, while the other two are just case counts because we have a lot less cases of Jamestown canine virus and lacrosse encephalitis. But for West Nile, the Culex species of mosquito that transmits West style, um, we see more on the western and southwest part of the state because it likes those prairie or agricultural lands um, compared to something like Jamestown Canyon virus is transmitted by snowmelt 80s mosquitoes. And those mosquitoes actually have a habitat that's a lot more similar to something like the black legged tick and follows more of that seasonality. Lacrosse encephalitis is from the eastern tree hole mosquito and it likes shaded hardwood areas. And we see that um, almost exclusively in the southeast part of the state. So, um, you know, tick-borne diseases are a bit more focused in the north central part, but it's really interesting to see how basically every corner of the state will have a different mosquito-borne disease they are um, at higher risk for, which is interesting to see. And then our numbers of mosquito-borne disease compared to um, our tick-borne diseases that are in the thousands, we have far less, but again, most of our cases are people that were critically ill um, and had a, a lot longer of a disease course in some of our tick-borne diseases. So West Nile, our most common, is in the Navy. Lacrosse encephalitis is in the Green. And then Jamestown Canyon virus doesn't start until 2013 when it was first identified in Minnesota. Um, and we've had a decent amount of cases since. Unlike our tick-borne disease where it's it's pretty much the steady upward um, increase. Mosquito-borne diseases fluctuate a lot more based on the various climactic factors um, and a lot more things impact it. So it's not as easy of a trend to see. It fluctuates a lot more. So tick and mosquito bite prevention. There's a few different ways you can prevent um, mosquito-borne diseases. First, I'm sorry, my cat is being annoying in the corner, um, you can create physical barriers. So if you notice mosquitoes are coming into your house, you know, close the windows, um, put screens up, putting physical barriers with clothing. So long pants, long sleeve shirts. I know that can be very tricky in the summer. If you can wear a hat and have a mosquito net over it, if you are doing work outside and are just being swarmed, um, that can help a lot to reduce your bites. We wanna remove or empty any mosquito breeding habitat. A lot of people will have yards that have um, just set up mosquitoes to have a wonderful breeding habitat, like um, the bird baths. So that's stagnant, yucky, mucky water. Mosquitoes adore it. So if every day or two you can just empty it out and put clean water in, that can really help reduce the amount of mosquitoes in and around your home. And then using an EPA registered repellent. Protecting yourself from tick-borne diseases, a lot of the same things. First, knowing when and where you are at risk. So remembering even if it is not a nice summer day, ticks can still be out, especially this year with, you know, our earlier spring, there can be a little snow on the ground and you could still be at risk. So keeping that in mind that you should still be doing tick checks um, if you're spending a lot of time outside in wooded areas. Again, if you can wear long pants, long sleeve shirt, Tucking your socks into your pants is also really helpful. Um, if you have rubber boots, ticks don't always wanna crawl up that. And then using an EPA registered repellent, doing daily tick checks. If you are someone that is working outside for 10 hours a day, probably do it more than just once a day. Um, do it throughout the day. If you can have a buddy also check you for ticks, that is really helpful. 
when I've done field work, I thought I've done a pretty good tick check. And then my coworker will be like, Alex, you have a tick on the back of your neck and there's no way I could have, could have seen it. So it's really helpful to have someone also give you a look over if you are doing a really high risk activity for tick-borne disease. Um, tossing your clothing in the dryer. If you come home after being outside, just stick all your gear, high heat, 10 minutes, it will kill the ticks. And then a good way people get ticks in their house is also their furry friends. So if you have a dog or cat that goes outside, um, a tick could attach on them. And then when you are cuddling them, giving them love, um, that tick might find you a more, more suitable host. So talk to your vet. There's tons of oral, topical, you know, flea and tick collars to help keep ticks off your pets and in turn keep them off of you. Um, we always recommend using an EPA registered repellent. That just means it is proven safe and effective. Any repellent you pick up at the store, there should be an EPA registration number if it has been registered by the EPA. And that is just on the back, normally right next to the barcode. Follow the label instructions, reapply as needed, and then wash your hands and shower afterwards. On the bottom, there is a link to the EPA's repellent website, or if you just Google EPA insect repellent, it should be the first um, result that pops up, but they have a really great search tool where you can enter different criteria, um, like if you wanna protect yourself from ticks or mosquitoes, how long you're gonna be outside, if you have a specific active ingredient, you know, whether it's deep, picaridin, um, whatever specific thing you want it to be the active ingredient. And then I'll give you a list of every single insect repellent that has been registered that meets that specific criteria. So this is a very useful tool. Um, people have found good use of it. Permethrin is amazing. Um, if you do not use it, you should. It is an insecticide um, that will kill or repel ticks and mosquitoes, and you use it to treat your clothing or gear. So like the photo, um, don't apply it while you are wearing the clothes, but go outside, you spray down um, things like boots, your clothing, your tent, any other supplies you're going to be using, and then it will have a layer of protection that lasts through multiple washings. And the label will tell you, you know, you can wash your clothes 10 times before you need to apply. It's kind of dependent on the specific product. Or you can buy pre-treated clothing, but it's pretty cheap just to get the, you know, spray bottle of it and then be able to reapply it throughout the season. Um, so it's a really great product, especially for people that are not the best about remembering each day or maybe forget to reapply. Um, that you can do this once and then you're set for the week. And again, do not put it directly on your skin. Removing a tick. If you find a tick, remove it as soon as possible. Um, you can use tweezers if you are camping and have no tweezers, just to use your fingers. Um, grab it as close to as what we refer to the head as possible, and then just pull it up slowly and gently. Don't twist it. Don't try to gouge yourself. Just slowly and gently. If the mouth parts are left in your skin, that is totally fine. Um, that is a myth that if the mouth parts are there, somehow the tick can keep transmitting um, a pathogen to you. That is not true. If the mouth parts are in there, they'll eventually work their way out. And then just clean the area with soap and water. Watch for symptoms. Even if you remove the tick right away, you were clearly in an area that had other ticks. So it's still a good idea to go to your doctor if you feel sick at all, because maybe there is another tick um, that was not able to be removed because it was pesky and hidden somewhere. And then disease times by um, the pathogen. So different pathogens have varying times to transmit. So Lyme disease, generally 24 to 48 hours of the tick needing to be attached before it can transmit um, Borrelia burgdorferi that causes Lyme disease. Anaplasmosis, we think is somewhere between 12 and 24 hours. Babesiosis, a little over a day. And then Powassan virus, at least in mice studies, is less than 15 minutes. So Powassan virus is very rare, um, but that's a good reason to remove the tick as soon as possible. Um, don't wait and try to schedule a doctor's appointment so they can take it out for you. The quicker you can get the tick off, um, the quicker you are lowering your disease risk. And then we do not recommend you test your tick as it's not a good diagnostic tool. Um, as you know, the slide before, about one in three um, black-legged ticks can carry that bacteria that causes Lyme disease. So if you test a tick, there's a decent chance it will indeed be positive um, for Lyme, but that does not mean it was transmitted to you. Um, it may not have been attached long enough. Even if it was attached long enough, it's not guaranteed that you will get Lyme disease. Um, so it's just not super helpful in that way. 
Additionally, maybe you tested the tick and it was negative, but you had another tick on you. You don't want that false sense of assurance that it's like the one tick I tested was negative, but you very well could have been infected by a different tick. And generally, by the time you get tick results back, you would have already started having symptoms if you were to become symptomatic. So we don't recommend testing the tick, but we do offer tick identification at the Department of Health. And we have a form on our website you can fill out with your info, where you found the tick, um, areas you had traveled, it has instructions. If you're outside a lot, you probably know what uh, you know a black legged tick and a dog tick look like. But if you want us to verify, send it on over. Or if you find a tick that is not one of those more common species or is a lone star tick or something you think looks a little funky, please send it in to us. We'd love to see it and be able to identify it. And then we, of course, follow up with what we find on identification. And then I also like to just end with, we have a ton of info on our website um, or things that we can mail out to you, or if you have a group you think could use some info, we have tick ID cards that have our, you know, two most common species on the front and have bits about tick removal on the back, posters, fact sheets, videos, tons of different stuff um, that is really helpful. So just shoot me an email if you're interested in me hacking you a little box of goodies and sending it your way. And that is it. Oh, I think we're wonderful, Alex. Uh, we'll ask you to you'll go, go ahead and keep your slide up, and uh, then okay. uh, Lauren's going to ask questions uh, to you that have been uh, coming up in the Q and A. Uh, please put your questions in the Q and A, and uh, we'll continue. All right, first two questions are kind of similar. So, first one is how reliable are lab tests in diagnosing these tick-borne diseases? How soon after a bite should lab tests be administered? The other one is, are the blood tests to check for tick-borne diseases other, or are there other tests to test for tick-borne diseases? Like multiple tick-borne diseases? Yeah, other okay. than just the Lyme's disease test. Yeah, so generally for testing in general, we recommend waiting until you are symptomatic to be tested. Um, people that go in that just had a bite and have not yet developed symptoms, um, you probably are not going to test positive yet if you were infected. So we recommend not testing yourself until you are symptomatic. Um, and it does depend on the disease, what testing is recommended. So something like Babesia, you would probably do a PCR or a blood smear that can look for the parasites. There's a bunch of different testing for Lyme. Um, and it can be a little bit tricky depending on how acute your infection is. I know with Lyme disease, people get tested for symptoms that they maybe have had for many years. Um, so you would look for something like the IgG antibodies, um, but Lyme disease, there's two-tier testing is the most common where it's a screen and then another either Western blot or another um, amino assay, um, which is relatively reliable. And there have been some newer tests that have come about to help detect disease earlier. Um, and as far as testing for different diseases, it's very provider dependent. What is ordered, sometimes they'll do, you know, order one Lyme test and then they'll order, you know, an anaplasma PCR and then a Babesia PCR, or there are things where it's a panel. So um, Mayo, for example, has a panel that's serology is for our three most common tick-borne diseases. Um, but yeah, if you ever have any questions about specific testing, feel free to give us a call at the health department and we can help guide that um, or providers will give us a call and we can chat through best testing options. I think the last part of that is, do you know how accurate those tests oh, are yes. for tick-borne diseases? Um, so it it's tricky. So a lot of times we are looking at serology, so your antibody response. So when someone um, maybe doesn't have the most acute symptoms and they have antibodies, it's not entirely clear if their symptoms were due to something like Lyme disease or something else, or you just got bit at some point in your life and you have been having these, you know, IgG antibodies for 10 years. Um, so it does depend a lot on the pathogen and what testing is ordered. And that is based on if you are still acutely infected or not. Um, but that's why, again, we recommend not testing unless you're symptomatic. Um, and hopefully the provider can gauge if you sound like you are a, a legitimate case. And then does what you wear when you are out in the woods in any way affect your chances of picking up a tick? I've heard that light color colored clothing makes it less likely than dark color colored clothing. Is that true? 
Yeah. So we recommend like color clothing just so it's easy to see a tick. Um, if you're wearing black, I mean, the nymphal ticks, it's the size of a poppy seed and they're basically just look like a black dot. So really, really easy to miss, especially if you're wearing black. So when I go in the field, I actually wear a white painter suit, um, but it's just much easier to spot that way. And then um, something like rubber boots, like ticks, maybe it's a little harder to grab on if they were trying to climb up your leg compared to just, you know, jeans down to your ankles. Um, so it's kind of dependent, but um, having good insect repellent is definitely the best, best plan of attack wearing light colors so you can spot the ticks and then routine tick checks as you go throughout your day. And then somebody is asking about the per permethrin. Um, yeah. They're worried that if they apply it to their clothing and it touches their skin, is that something that can like affect their skin? Yeah. So once it's dry, it's totally safe. Um, so just spray it outside. You probably should wear gloves. I'm sure that's on the instructions, but once it's dry, it's totally safe to be on your skin. You just don't want to be applying it while actively wearing clothes and then just let it hang outside until it's no longer wet. And then this person must have pets. Um, how do we protect ourselves? Our pups get preventative meds, any human preventative meds being researched on the horizon? Yeah. So there is a Lyme vaccine that is in stage three clinical trials right now. I think it'll be available maybe 2026. Um, TBD though. So that is in the works and there's always other things that are being researched, but right now we just focus on doing tick checks wearing insect repellent, if you can treat your clothing and gear, um, and just being conscious of when you're out and about there. Unfortunately, it's not an easy oral meds like we can give our dogs every month. Um, yeah, for humans available, but maybe someday. <laughs> and then can you spray your yard slash outside property to kill slash prevent ticks? Yeah. So um, people, some people will treat their um, land at home with pesticides. We would recommend call, consulting with a pesticide specialist and you would want to make sure you're doing it um, at specific times. So maybe early in the spring before those ticks come out. And then again, in the fall, you wouldn't need to do it consistently throughout, but you'd want to pick based on when we're going to see um, spikes in tick activity. Um, and then it also is helpful for landscape modifications. If people will um, focus on the edge habitat and then have a barrier between their yard and the forested um, area. So if you can put like a few feet of wood chips or mulch or something, the ticks won't necessarily want to cross that. Um, if you have um, kids at home, like a place set, having that not right up against the wooded area, put it more into the grass by a few feet, that can help a lot too. But for specific pesticides recommendations, we would send you to a specialist that can give um, more perspective on your specific land at home. And then can you be treated for Lyme's disease if many years have passed since your tick bite? Um, yeah, so that, that would be provider dependent on what they want to do. Um, it's so a term that comes up a lot is chronic Lyme disease, um, which we do not recommend because it's um, insinuating that you're chronically infected, which is not the case. We use post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome as the term, because there are people who had Lyme disease, had symptoms, got treated, and then will continue to feel sick afterwards. And what we do know is long-term antibiotic use is not effective. And there can be a lot of negative things that happen when you are using antibiotics for an extended period of time. Um, but definitely talk to your doctor, see if treatment is something that is right for you. But it is tricky when it's been years later and um, figuring out if Lyme is what is actually attributing to your symptoms or not. So just conversation with the provider on the best way to continue with that. And then what is being projected to change in our disease risk from insects as climate change makes its, makes Minnesota warmer, wetter, et cetera? Yeah, there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, we always try to be a little bit vague because um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We do have been tending to see an increase in our um, tick-borne diseases and areas where they are distributed. Um, but there's a lot that is unknown, but maybe just ticks moving a bit, a bit north. And then it seems that ticks are more active in the spring than in the summer. When I spend time in the woods during the summer months, I rarely worry or see ticks. Why is this? Should I be more careful and cautious in the summer? 
Yeah. I mean, it's still good to be cautious at any time, but we are nymphal ticks are out in the spring. And then as the summer comes, they will go to molt into the adult tick that will then come out in, you know, earlier fall. And so the mosquitoes are kind of main in the summer, but ticks are more of in the spring and fall, even though there will be some ticks out in the summer, especially like American dog ticks. But that's kind of where they're going to hatch or going to molt and then become the adult. So less, less activity from them. And then can you expand on footwear suggestions for prevention? Yeah. So definitely depends on your activity. Um, when I'm out in the field, I think it's easy to wear rubber boots, which may not be the best depending on what you are doing outside um, or just any hiking boots. If you can have longer socks that you can tuck into your pants, that's helpful too, just so the ticks are then crawling on your clothes and not directly getting to your skin. Um, or if you're using permethrin, spraying your boots and having them treated that way, or even with insect repellent can help them. Um, not get on you, but ticks just don't go up that far on the vegetation. So they won't get onto you past um, your shin when they initially attach. So they will want to go for your foot or something like your shin a little bit lower. So those are really good areas to focus on treating with um, some sort of repellent or insecticide. And then I've heard that permethr permethrin is toxic for cats and dogs. Is that a concern if you use it and have pets in your house? Yeah, it should be fine once it is dry. Again, you wouldn't want a cat like while you're actively spraying it and it's wet, um, but it should be safe for them once it is um, dried out. And then years ago, I was bitten by a black legs tick, went to the doctor and had it removed within 48 hours, maybe 24 hours. The doctor gave me an a one-time antibiotic, one pill dose, should that be followed up with a full regimen of antibiotics? Yes. So that would be dependent on if you became somatic. Um, so some doctors will give a prophylactic dose of doxycycline, which is the common antibiotic we use for Lyme and anaplasmosis. Um, the caveat being that prophylactic dose of doxy, we only know it to be effective for Lyme disease. So if you were infected with a different disease like Babesia or Anaplasma or had a co-infection, which can happen, we have ticks that will carry multiple diseases and people will be unlucky and get infected by multiple things from one tick. Um, so that you would need a full coat course of antibiotics if you were to become symptomatic and tested positive. Um, if it was something like Babesia, that's a parasitic um, infection, you would need both an anti um, antiparasitic and an antibiotic. So you would want to, if you had symptoms, go back into your doctor, get tested um, for a panel of tick-borne diseases, and then they could treat you appropriately based on that. And then I, or do I increase the tick, tick risk on my property by ex Extensive bird feeders in my yard includes wood borders. Feeders attract squirrels too. So it sounds like they're worried that their bird feeders may attract the, the ticks and the mosquitoes. Yeah. I mean, if you have a lot of critters, then they can definitely bring in ticks. Um, if they're at the outskirts of your yard, at least that's a little bit better. Um, but yeah, birds and squirrels and mice and things can definitely carry ticks into your yard. So something to consider, but obviously up to you how much you love having your bird feeders and getting to see all the fun, funny animals around your house. Okay. Let me, sorry, more questions are popping up here. Um, okay. the top here we have, I am out walking our dogs in the woods twice a day. We picked 50 deer ticks off the dogs last week. My doctor gave me a prescription for doxycycline with instructions to take two tablets. If you have an embedded tick. It dramatically decreased, decreases the chances of developing a bacteria, tick-borne disease. So maybe that's just a comment. I don't know if you want to elaborate yep. on that. Yeah. And so the prophylactic dose will work for Lyme um, if it started early enough after the attached tick. But if you were to develop or be infected with another pathogen other than the Borrelia burgdorferi, um, we don't believe that to have the same efficacy. So still a good idea to watch for symptoms and to get testing if um, things arise. And then I'm located in Prescott, Wisconsin, right on the border of Minnesota. I found a Lone Star tick last year. The University of Madison wasn't interested in logging the info. Would the U of M want that info? Yeah, at the Department of Health, we will always um, 
take Lone Star Ticks. If you want to send it to us, um, we also have an email where you can send pictures, though we do prefer to have um, the physical tick and be able to look it under the microscope and go through the dichotomous key. But yeah, if you ever find a Lone Star Tick, send it our way. And our website has the submission form um, and our email and instructions and all, all of that stuff. But we do try to keep a log of every reported Lone Star Tick um, found in Minnesota. Even if it was Wisconsin, we would still be happy to ID it and take a peek at it. And then it sounds like ticks don't go high up in the trees. Does this mean they won't get on your body by brushing up against tree leaves? Yeah, so they won't go more than a few feet when they're questing and trying to grab onto you. So they shouldn't come up past your shin if you're just walking through, but they of course can latch onto you and then crawl their way up. Um, but yeah, they're not crawling up far into the trees <laughs> and they won't drop on you, which is very good. And then is there any evidence that forced fires or controlled burns in areas helps to reduce the risk of or reduce the tick population for an extended period of time? Yeah, so there's kind of um, mixed reviews on this. It's not something we would like actively recommend to the general public, but um, there are some thoughts. You would have to burn it hot enough and long enough. It's getting um, to like the leaf litter because ticks will go and try to scurry themselves under the leaf litter where they will want to stay cool and retain, retain some moisture. Um, and similar to the pesticides, if you did it, you'd probably want to stagger it out in early spring before we're having the nymphal ticks come in. Um, and then in the fall when they're going to make their reappearance as adults. But of course, with that, as things start to regrow, we can still have our, you know, mice and squirrel friends that will then um, let some hit ticks hitch a ride and come back into your yard. So some mixed reviews. Um, and I don't know a ton about it, but I could definitely point you to someone who might have some more info on the fire aspect. <laughs> And then will there be a larger tick population this season due to the warm winter we've experienced? Yeah, such a good question. And I do not have a concrete answer. I'm not quite sure. Um, we haven't started any field work yet this year, but it's definitely possible. However, I do not know what we will see since there are a lot of factors that can play into it. So we shall see how, how the year progresses. <laughs> And then what is best prevention for mosquito bites? What do you find works best? Bites tend to go through their clothing. So they're worried about clothing not being thick enough. Yeah. Um, so thicker clothing, I know that's very hard when it is um, toasty outside. But if you can spray your clothes with permethrin, that at least adds that layer. Um, things like picaridin and then any repellent that's like 20 to 30 percent DEET is really good. Um, if you have other specific active ingredients, that EPA website, you can um, put in what specific things you're looking for, and it'll give you a whole slew of repellents that will meet that criteria. But yeah, mosquitoes are tricky. They <laughs> love to bite us. <laughs> and then it seems that ticks like to crawl up before latching onto a human. Are they looking for thin skin or what are they looking for? Yeah. That is a very good question. I think it's more just they want to be in a safe spot to attach. So if you are getting, you know, smacked with the brush as you're walking through, they want a nice, you know, quiet, not getting hit by anything area. So it's easier. They love like behind the ear, behind the knee. Um, if you have a lot of hair, it's easy for it to, to get in there and find a good spot. So I'm assuming that's why they crawl up. It's just um, kind of less of them getting hit by the various things in the forest but I don't have a great answer on that. <laughs> and then do you know what is the best cat safe tick repellent? I would chat with your veterinarian about that. I, there's a lot of oral medications and I think some you can do every three months even. Um, and then there's some topical ones too. So I would just chat with your veterinarian what makes most sense for you and your lifestyle. And then do you have any thoughts on why in Hennepin County, there's a higher rate of mosquito diseases? Yeah, well, there's a lot of humans, so that does help um, that we're just seeing a lot more case numbers just since our population is higher. Um, and it might also just be who's going in and getting tested. We do see a decent amount of mosquitoes um, that are positive for things like West Nile in the metro area. Um, we do in the seven county metro have the Metropolitan Mosquito Control District, and they do um, testing of mosquito pools and we'll test them for West Nile virus. And maybe that helps um, pique people's interest that they should go get tested if they feel symptomatic. Um, 
but there's also just a lot of humans in the metro area. So a lot more cases to be had. And then what happens if it rains when you have clothes treated with per permithr permithrin? <laughs> I'm going to get it right say. one of these times. <laughs> Yeah, so it will um, last through multiple wash cycles. Um, it depends on the exact uh, um, when you're using, but normally it's like between like five and 15 times washing um, the gear that protection will last. So um, raining would be fine. Just you might need to reapply it a little bit earlier if you're continually caught in the rain, if that kind of equals what it would be to wash your clothes, depending on how much of a downpour you're getting. And then can you tell us more about the new strain of or Ehrlichiosis, is that how you pronounce yeah. that? Yeah, the Ehrlichia miris oclarensis. Um, so Ehrlichia is pretty similar to anaplasma. It's just another bacterial infection. Um, Ehrlichia chathiensis, and we have Owingii. There's a few other species that have been associated with the Lone Star Tick, which is not yet established. And then this other species of um, miris oclarensis was found in the black legged tick, which we do have here. So um, Similar to our other tick-borne diseases, symptoms of like fever, headache, people get pretty bad like body or joint aches with Ehrlichia or anaplasma. Um, and then there's a lot of um, laboratory tests you can do to help determine if you are infected. And then a short-ish course of doxycycline will normally treat people up pretty good and will feel a lot better after even a few days into antibiotic use. And then this person has a pond, so kind of in a marshy area. Um, they're wondering if it's likely to be the source of mosquitoes and do mosquito dunkers work to keep them from growing? If so, how can I know when to use them? That is an excellent question. Um, yeah, and we have so many different mosquitoes that all have, um, very different habitat needs and some will transmit disease. Others won't. I don't know a ton about the dunkers, but I, if you send me an email, I can put you in contact with um, some folks at the Metropolitan Mosquito Control District that would um, be much smarter than I at all things mosquito control and give you some better info. And then somebody mentioned in the Philippines, eating lemongrass and using centronella soap is common for mosquito prevention. Do you have any data on either of those strategies? Yeah, so there are a lot of people that want um, the very natural route. So lemon of oil eucalyptus is a common um, natural ingredient. We would still recommend using an EPA registered repellent, and they do have some of those more natural things on their website that you can search for too, but it's hard when they're not tested. Um, they might be effective, but we don't know if there's, um, haven't been like seriously studied for safety and efficacy. So if you are looking for something like that, I would put it in the EPA website. They have different natural ingredients you can search for and still go with one of those, just since you know it has been tested and proven effective. Um, but depending on how many mosquito bites you are getting, you know, that should play a role into what level of protection you want to um, have. And then how long after infection slash symptoms do antibiotics remain effective? Like to restart an antibiotic course? That seemed like that. Um, I'm not sure. They didn't really elaborate on that. Mm. So after infection. So... Can you read it one more time? I'm, so how long after infection symptoms do antibiotics remain effective? I'm wondering if they're if they got infected and waited to do the antibiotics until later. Yeah, eh, it would depend. Um, yeah, I'm not super sure. It would depend on the disease, um, how long after. I mean, if you you think you've had symptoms for like 10 years, will an antibiotic course now do anything? You're probably no longer actively infected. Um, so it would, it would depend on the person and the disease, but definitely chat with your doctor and see what they think is a, a good course of treatment. And then last year in Northeast Minnesota, the mosquitoes were horrible. What factors predict a bad mosquito summer? Yeah, so a lot of different factors, and it depends if it's our spring species or summer species, um, things like drought and then rain, um, temperature, all sorts of things. So if there's a lot of drought, we could have unhatched mosquitoes that have been hanging around for years, and suddenly there's enough water that they can then hatch, or if there's too much water, it can wash away um, eggs. So a lot of different things will impact it dependent on the mosquito. Um, and that's why we see such big fluctuations year to year where we don't see quite that with our ticks. It's mosquitoes are a little bit more picky, and we have so many different species that all have different needs. And then is it true that possums eat ticks? 
They do. They're just great. Eat them all up. <laughs> Alex uh, and Lauren, I think what we'll do is uh, I'll have you stop sharing your screen. We'll continue with the questions, but I have some closing slides that I want to show before 10 o'clock, if you would, please. Um, let me yep. go back to sharing my screen here and we'll close out, but we'll continue. Uh, stay on the webinar and we'll continue with those questions. Uh, but I just have a few slides here at the end uh, and then we'll get back to the questions. Well, thank you again for attending today's webinar uh, with uh, Alex. Alex did an excellent job uh, here uh, talking about Minnesota ticks and mosquitoes and what we should know about. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, again, we'll continue uh, after uh, these closing remarks. We had an excellent season for Fridays with a Forester. These are our, our uh, uh, sites and, and, and topics uh, that we did this year. You can actually go back to uh, Fridays with a Forester uh, to our Z-Link, uh, z.umn.edu slash Fridays uh, is our Z-Link that has all the recordings on there, actually for a past few years. Uh, Eli Sagor is one of our uh, program leaders for the Natural Resources uh, Extension team in Natural Resources and Forestry, and he has some closing comments he'd like to share. Hey, everybody. Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, acknowledge uh, the work that uh, Gary had done uh, for this year's Fridays with a Forester session, it's really been wonderful. Uh, he just had a list there of the nine topics that we presented this year. Um, this has been a banner year. We really see this as a, a valuable offering of our extension forestry team with the University of Minnesota. Attendance has been growing every year that we've done this. Uh, this year, uh, I was uh, chatting with some of our extension teammates. We got over 200 attendees for the first time. We really appreciate uh, your interest in these sessions. I've posted a few times in the chat where you can see all the recordings. Gary has mentioned this as well. It really is a nice repository of good information available for free uh, about your Minnesota woodlands. Um, we uh, really appreciate your feedback on this series. Uh, when you leave this session, uh, you'll see a feedback form let us know what topics you're interested in, what we can do better on, and so on. Uh, but again, I wanted to acknowledge Gary's work. Gary really took the lead on sort of conceiving and carrying forward this uh, Fridays with a Forester series over the last few years. I want to thank him for that and, uh, and, and recognize it. Again, averaging over about 160 uh, people per session, 1,500 or so people reached throughout this year. Um, and, uh, and, and really it's a nice offering. Uh, so I wanted to, Gary's very good at thanking other people, but I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge his work as well. Um, one last thing I want to do, I'll just watch the chat if you're interested. If you don't already get our My Minnesota Woods email newsletter, uh, I suggest that you subscribe. It's free and you'll be sure to receive announcements of future offerings like this. Um, Gary, thanks again. And that's all I've got. Great. Thanks, Eli. I appreciate your comments. And again, as you close, we'll, we'll finish the questions again uh, for those questions that we still have. Uh, but as you close your Zoom, uh, you'll have an evaluation opportunity for your browser. Uh, these are all anonymous, but we do uh, have at the end, if you want to continue with your email uh, correspondence uh, with our forestry team or uh, in, in, uh, join our newsletter uh, list, uh, you can certainly add your email to that uh, evaluation. Also, please share your comments about today's webinar and then the future uh, webinars that we want to do maybe for 2025. Uh, again, thank you very much for joining us today. There's some uh, uh, Z-Links there. Uh, Z-Links, uh, all the recordings are uh, z-links.z.umn.edu slash Fridays. Uh, and then uh, there's my Minnesota Woods newsletter uh, attachment there too.